Today's guest is Rob Sirstens. He's a local coach in the area. And when I say coach, he <laughs> shares the same sentiment as me. He's like, I kind of hate the term life coach. And I, <laughs> I feel that way too. He's like, we'll call him an alignment coach. He's doing deep work with people. He's pulling people out of the muck and into alignment with their higher selves. Um, he, uh, wow, you're going to be glued. <laughs> I don't have to, I'm just going to get, let him get into it. Cause you're going to be glued to this interview. Once he starts talking incredibly powerful, like it was so cool, honestly, for me. Um, cause I've, I've seen Rob locally. I see him here and there. I see him online sometimes. Um, but I didn't know his full story and it was just like, wow, so powerful. So excited for you guys to experience it. Um, I just wanted to alert you real quick before we get into it. He does have a book. It's called Ego of the Warrior. You can get that on his website. It's robsurstens.com. So it's two eyes and Surstens. robsurstens.com. We'll link that up. You can find him on social media. Um, I know he speaks a lot. He's out there. He does such a great job sharing his story and sharing from his heart, which is what you can really feel throughout this interview. So We'll go ahead and get into it. Here is Rob Surstens. All right. So Rob, uh, it's been kind of cool. I've seen you around, you know, we obviously have very similar, I, I'd say interests, lifestyles, you know, we've seen each other at our friend Matt's mutual friend, Matt's breath work workshop sometimes. And I've seen the work that you're doing online and I'm just like, cool. You know, it's, right. I definitely resonate and right. You know, we talked about you do similar work as me. You're helping people get back into alignment. You're going deep into their soul, right. helping them, you know, get all those entangled messes. Like, where did this start? And like, how do we get back out of this path? You know, but I thought I'd start with your own journey. And could you share how you got to this place, how you got to doing this as your work? Yeah, it's super interesting. Um, it started from birth. I was, you know, I... I was born into a very chaotic situation with a teenage girl and a four-year-old sister. And that was the first few months of my life, homeless, um, abandoned at times. And, you know, until we were given up by the state for adoption. And I was adopted. I was born in Phoenix. My my four-year-old sister at the time was born in Spokane, Washington. So, you know, you, you could tell that she moved around a lot, just trying to survive. And... Then I got adopted in Salt Lake City, Utah, and thrown right into the Mormon religion. And so I grew up in a place of a lot of rejection and a lot of being told I'm not good enough wow. or equal or any of those other words that you want to throw at it. Uh, the N-word got tossed at me a lot growing up, and I got beat by older kids. And that was kind of my story. And so... From abandonment to rejection, I was already on a path of self-hate and a lot of anger and rage. Mm. But what I found, I found solace in sports. I, I, I was definitely a gifted athlete. I could run faster and jump higher than kids five or 10 years older than me. And that's where I found that the scale started to balance. Mm. And, but once that sport was over, then it was back to the being bullied and the self-rejection and all that. So that lasted until about freshman year in high school, in high school. And then I started to have friends and, you know, hip hop started to get popular in the nineties and it was kind of different, but I lost my, not that I found myself, but I felt I had to fit this persona of what it was like to be black in a very white world of Salt Lake City, Mormon, Utah. And so I dressed the dress, I talked the talk, I would study the movies and the MTV so I, so I could, you know, represent something that I wasn't. Wow. But I was just trying to be accepted and belong the best I could. So I eventually got a full ride scholarship to University of Utah. Um, and then I also got invited to play at the same time for the USA Junior Olympic rugby team. And so I had kind of a fork in the road of what I wanted to do, but I would say football was my first love and rugby was my mistress. And so I went on to play football. And unfortunately, before that, I got the summer before I started up at the University of Utah, I got T-boned in an intersection at 80 miles an hour by a police officer who ran a red light to go assist another police officer. 
Wow. And with so, such high hopes and dreams, I went from being the guy that could play injured and hurt to the guy that was get, getting injured all the time. And, you know, 20, 23 years ago at the U, it was all about how much you could lift. It wasn't necessarily tied in with anything else. The coaches and, and strength coaches wanted to see how much you lift. So my back continued to go out, out on me from my herniated disc from the accident. Wow. And so I would earn a starting spot as a true freshman and get hit awkwardly and be out for a couple of games or for the season. And that happened for about two and a half seasons until I reluctantly had to walk away. You know, I, the shame was too great. And it was right when Coach Meyer, Urban Meyer came in and it was, it was super frustrating to be the guy that was always injured with, you know, he was supposed to have all this potential and everything. So I unfortunately had to walk away and, you know, I stepped into even more confusion with my life because my one saving grace was going to be playing football on Sundays. And I knew that's what I was going to do. And unfortunately I didn't even come close. And so after football, I actually elected to go, to go on an LDS mission because that's what I was supposed to do. And in my eyes and my feelings, you know, I felt God was punishing me in a way because I didn't fulfill my duty as a man. Oh, man. So I ended up going to Neocan, Argentina, and in the Patagonia, and I served honorably and, you know, worked hard and returned and, you know, and had to figure out what to do. And so I picked up rugby again, started, started playing semi-pro and pro rugby, but it was nothing like the Warriors are now. It was, you know, we weren't getting paid and just running around and hitting and finishing my college degree. Um you know, and I got married. And then five years later, I got divorced, had a beautiful daughter. And all that just seemed like very hard. It was really, really hard for me. I would say for the 35 years, everything was just hard. Mm -hmm. Because I had this mindset that number one, I was I was a mistake, that I didn't belong. And this victim mentality, right? And it ran me. And so as I was trying to find myself, my place in this world, it just seemed to get more and more uphill because number one, I wasn't in any sort of alignment with who I was as a man. And my anger and my rage, they were the crutch that I leaned on continually. If anyone was to explain to me or, you know, how would you explain yourself, Rob? I'd be like, I'm angry. And people would laugh it off like, Awkwardly, I'm like, no, I'm just an angry human being. Mm -hmm. People would see me at the gym like, Rob, how do you get your body like that? You train so hard. I'm just like, I'm just fucking angry. Yeah. You know, and that's how I'd always explain myself mm -hmm. until, you know, it eventually led to a suicide attempt. And in 2017, where I was ready to leave this life and, you know, the victimhood had taken over, the knowing, the feeling of knowing that I didn't belong. And then, you know, obviously that, that didn't go through, but I realized, you know, because I almost took my own life with a gun, I had to figure out if I was to set this gun down, I had to figure out a way to live and live intentionally and live with purpose. Because all my purpose and intention before that was playing football. And then after football was over, it was sitting in victim, wondering why it didn't happen for me. And that lasted for years, over a decade. Mm. And... But what I found is the moment I shifted intention and I'm like, okay, what does this look, what does this life look like if I begin to live intentionally? I started calling in people that never before I thought I would connect with that weren't athletes, weren't rugby players, weren't football players, weren't athletes in general. And I started calling in a, a different spiritual community. And I had long left the church after that and identified the trauma and the impact it had in my life as well. And once I started doing that, I started healing bit, bit by bit, bit by bit, mm -hmm. right? And I started identifying my stories. I started identifying my core traumas of abandonment, of bullying, of racism, right? Of the self-hate and the stories that I told myself that I actually believed. For so long, I was re reading a scripture that was telling me my skin was cursed, right? And so that really messed with me. And I realized I embodied all that. And no matter how hard I worked, it was never good enough. And once I started shifting those stories with the appropriate people in my life 
and helping me call me out on my bullshit, my blind spots. Mm -hmm. I stepped into a trajectory that I never knew existed of abundance, of success, of love, of true connection, right? It came in a way I never thought possible, but it all had to do with the intention I made for myself, right? And then so many other things happened during that time. I was working in corporate America. I was never meant to be in sales. I'm, I'm an introvert. <laughs> I'm a very direct human being. I don't kiss people's ass to give a sale. I'm just terrible at sales and I'm terrible at corporate America. And so I created a, you know, a, a small product to called Vibral, where it massaged your small extremities of your body, a small uh, muscle roller, I guess you could call it with a metal end. And it's vibrating and we put it on a Kickstarter. I threw all these credit cards at it to make it fun. Called in one of my good friends and he helped fund it. And then the moment it got funded on Kickstarter, he emptied the funds and said, peace out. And so I couldn't fulfill it. And this is right before I, you know, almost took my own life. And the reason I'm circling back and just letting you know how to get, how I got from where I was to where I am today. And so I couldn't get it back, back into corporate America. I owed a lot of money to a lot of people that helped fund. And so I started personal training and I wasn't also a great personal trainer. I know how to train my body exactly how I want it. And I know how to put it in top competitions shape on the field. But when it comes to other people, I'm just like, yeah, just do what I do. <laughs> and, you know, it's nothing that I ever felt was my gift. It was to make money in order to get for the next thing. Mm -hmm. But what was interesting is during the last, that lasted for about three years, is the last year as I was stepping into my healing, every single one of my clients was like, Rob, you need to become a life coach. And I'm like, that's cheesy. That sounds stupid. <laughs> I'm not going to become a life coach, right? I'm going to figure something out, right? But it wasn't going to be a life coach. And once I got that in my head, you know, through the work that I was doing, I was like, hey, Rob, you can actually start really helping people. And I didn't want to be in personal training. I made the shift. And that was about, you know, five years ago. And since then, I've grown into having clients all over the world having men's groups and absolutely loving what I do every single day because I'm waking up with purpose. Mm. Right. And it, it's interesting because the last, I think two years ago, I got to a space of finally, finally being grateful and a place in gratitude that I did not make it in football because I'm seeing all my friends now come back from their careers and how broken their bodies are, how messed up their heads are. Right. And so I, I realized like, oh, this universe thing is real. Right. And so, yeah, that's pretty much my story up to now. Wow. Yeah. I didn't know all that. Yeah. Wow. That's yeah. amazing. Thank you. That was like the most powerful, <laughs> powerful answer to how did you start doing this that I've ever yeah. heard? Yeah. yeah. Um, there are so many key things that really rung out. One of them was um, when you were talking about being a teenager and like, looking at how you're supposed to act in this mm -hmm. white Mormon community. And you're like, I guess I'll be this guy. I guess I'll play, right. which is typical for teenagers in a lot of ways. Right. But it also, I feel like it also is such a, like a really powerful illustration of what a lot of us go through. And I'm sure you see it in your clients in in terms of this path of who am I supposed to be? Who do people right. like me to be? I'm going to fall into this path. And that programming is so heavy too. It's like, what are you going to be when you grow up to five-year-olds? Right. I'm going to be a teacher. Okay. Right. Teacher, stick with that one, you know, and <laughs> it's just this kind of this box. Um, and so it made me think like, that's obviously like you had to go through a huge, like, who am I actually, right. I'm not any of, I'm not any of that. I'm not this rejected kid. I'm not this, you know, <laughs> rap <laughs> imposter right. person, you know, right. and I'm curious, like in that part of your healing journey, what did you find helpful? Like what tools or strategies, books, people, you know, is there anything that comes to mind in terms of like letting go of all this, who I decided yeah. I was and yeah, so how you it, really were? It, it really, I really gave myself permission because, because when I stepped into this healing, it, it was definitely a place of do or die. It was, and it's just not how the saying goes. It was do or die. I either needed to heal or else I was going to remove myself off the face of this earth. 
And I had to wipe the slate clean, right? I had to take away, and that was with intention. I'm like, okay, I'm going to wipe the slate clean. Everything that I thought I was, I'm going to question. And I'm going to have someone support me with those stories, right? And I was able to surround myself to this day with the same powerful mentors and teachers Mm -hmm. that lovingly call me out of my bullshit and help me know what is a story and what is not. Mm -hmm. Right. And one big piece of that, you know, kind of to take it a step further is we're so bombarded with what it is to be a woman and what it is to be a man on social media. Right. And I know you get that all the time with, you know, your training and, and everything you go through. And it's super interesting because I feel so many men want to be something great and want to be something powerful. And then you get on social media and you see different influencers telling you what a man is. <laughs> and more, more 99 times out of 100, it's, it's, it's very toxic, hurtful stuff that's simply placating to the rage and anger and sadness. But if you do not have a direction or someone to support you in that journey, it's very easy to just take on and embody and be like, this is how I'm supposed to be. This is how I'm supposed to treat myself. This is how I'm supposed to treat my women. And that is what makes a man. And so it gets really, really confusing if you do not have someone to support you and be like, hey, that's a no. Mm -hmm. Right. And let me tell you why. Mm-hmm. Because there, there's this constant saying that we need to heal alone, like the real men and the real women and the warriors and the soldiers heal alone. And that's the biggest bullshit in the world. Oh. You yeah. can't actually heal alone. There's pieces that you can do for yourself. Absolutely. Right. But there's also a component, just like if you're training to better your body or you're lear- learning a new technical skill or something, whatever it is, you always need a coach and a teacher. And the same thing comes with healing. Mm -hmm. right and so it's really important for those listening when you're confused and wondering like okay who am I that's beautiful once you have that question and you want to know that desire that is the first step totally or it gets tricky though is where you start thinking and believing all the shit that you see online Mm -hmm. is what you need to be because I can tell you when you for those of you that have a relationship for those of us that have a relationship with our body and not everyone does right? A lot of people are all mind, haven't yet connected that body. They find it really easy just to take on whatever is told to them. Mm -hmm. And that's how they begin to operate. And then they wonder where they still feel so unfulfilled Mm -hmm. and still unhealed and still angry. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The mentors, teachers, coaches, you know, same, same thing as me, Mm -hmm. you know, and I, the way I look at it is one, like, I mean, you know, that when you're working with people, the way, the way that they think they need to, what they think they need to do, you know, Mm -hmm. sometimes you get that as like, I just need to blah, 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 blah. And it's like, you're like on Jupiter and we're over here on Mars. Like that, that's not even in this, it's a whole different frequency and you can't really, I mean, if you're on Jupiter, like you just be doing Jupiter things and it's like, you have a coach, they're going to bring you into another planet. Right. Like you don't even know this exists, the way of looking at things, the paradigm shifts. And so, yeah, obviously there's a lot we can do on our own, but yeah, I think that's so important what you said, because that's for me too. And then the other thing is you can't, you have blind spots and that's why I want good friends that are honest with me and coaches. I just did a session with my life changing you know, mentor yesterday and was like, "Mm, yep. Still got some old patterns in there. Yep. There they are again. (laughs) I've been doing that for, you know, five years. So well said, and let's hit on this ego thing because maybe we can transition this into your book in a second. Um, yeah, let's, let's hit on, on the idea of who we should be, what we should be, all of that. It's really interesting because as you get deeper into, a uh, spiritual journey, a healing journey. Um, it's not in a judgmental way. It's, it's with love, but you see a lot of these, well, I'll hit on men since you work with a lot of men, you work with women too, but it's just like, it's sad. I don't know how I know like I said, it's judgmental, but it's just, you see, you just see it for what it is. It's this, look at me. I have jets. I have cars. I have a perfect right. body. Look, 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 just another day on my private jet, you know? Right. And it's just like, 
I get it. They're tr- maybe they're trying to business coach. I don't know what it is, but it's just when you're more healed and you see those things, it's like, I don't know. I just feel my heart. I'm just like, Oh, much love. Like it doesn't um, uh, look like something I want, you know? And yeah, absolutely. There, there's <laughs> an ex- there's an external validation to that component. Right. Right. And I'll tell you, I've had a lot of those clients, mm-hmm. a lot of those clients mm-hmm. that have the cars, the planes, the houses. Right. And on paper, you know, 20 years ago, that would have looked amazing to me. Right. <laughs> But then I can start working with them and their psyche and how unfulfilled. And I call it the black hole effect. Mm. And it's usually, you know, I ask the question, like, what do you want once we had a relationship? And the answer with the, with a lot of these men is I want more. Right. It's that feeling of more, like the more I have this, this, you know, this destinational happiness, like once I get this and once I get that, then I'll be happy. Right. And it's, really sad to see. And then they realize that's no longer working. They're getting older. They don't really have really tight, close relationships or people they can actually trust Mm -hmm. because they've just been living the facade. Even if the money is real for them, Mm -hmm. they haven't been living a life of connection and Mm -hmm. being authentic to themselves. Right. And so they're some of my funnest clients because they're, they usually don't have an answer to why they are what, why they are where they are at the moment. Mm-hmm. Right. Because of, they're like, wait, I did all the things I was supposed to do. Mm-hmm. Why am I not fulfilled? And why am I not happy? Mm-hmm. And then it's super interesting. I was talking to one of them the other day and how desensitized he is of all the success he has. He could care less. Yep. Yep. He could care less. And so when it comes to the ego, I I always say, like, I'm never a fan of the term kill your ego. Um, There's a self-abandonment in that. Yeah. (laughs) But you can actually, with the more healing you do, create greater awareness with your ego. And your ego does serve you in a lot of capacities. Right. But on social media, like you were talking about, Mm -hmm. it's the external validation piece is very damaging because you look at a lot of these influencers and people, if Instagram was to fall off or TikTok was to fall off tomorrow, Mm -hmm. these people would have no identity of self. Mm -hmm. Right. And that's where it gets, gets interesting with a lot of these people. And so, and I'm not saying all these influencers don't have connection with body and heart. I'm just saying the ones we're talking about specifically. Right. Right. Right? And so, yeah, I, 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 I love, talking about the ego and helping people develop a beautiful relationship with what it is. Mm. Yeah. I think, uh, who is it? Ram Das says, uh, that your ego is your teammate, I believe right. is the word he uses for it. And I love right. that. And so let's kind of transition into that. So your book is called ego of the warrior. Why did mm-hmm. you call it that? What do you mean? Yeah. So I lived on my ego for trying to be something I wasn't for a good 35 years of my life. <laughs> and I call the methodology and the work that I do with my clients now warrior work. And the warrior is not this macho guy on the field of battle with a sword. I, I believe coming to your warrior is the journey that not many people are willing to take. And that is to truly find who you are authentically as a man or a woman right? Shut off all the protection, shut off all the pain and the trauma. Who was under that? And that's the journey of the warrior. And so that's why I named the book Ego of the Warrior. Beautiful. I I love how you put that too, is like, there was this overly living in the ego, right? Mm -hmm. Like, and we see that pendulum swing, right? I mean, I love Ryan holiday, but like we get this ego is the enemy kind of thing. Sure. You know? And, yeah, yeah. and that got kind of popularized, but it's like, it's almost like a pendulum swing. You know, right. like, don't, don't live in it. But the ego is like part of us and it serves us and helps us. So can you talk about like a little bit more about how you see like living in a balanced place with like your soul or higher self and your ego? Like, what does that look like? You yeah. Know? I mean, for me, it's, I mean, this is a very deep question we could talk about on <laughs> another podcast, but excuse me, Eckhart, could you please explain? Just kidding. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's for me, finding balance is also in harmony with the masculine and feminine. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. 
and yes, finding right. balance with that. Mm -hmm. And but also understanding when the ego is taking place. And one thing I talked about with with in on my men's calls is when I step on that rugby film, it's 100 percent ego. I want people to know that I'm there. I want people to know what I'm going to do to them. Right. And after I will be best friends with you and love you, but <laughs> that's when Rob ego takes place and it actually serves me. Okay. Right. That. There's yeah. different places. My ego shows up somewhat in the gym, not in I'm, I'm, I'm better than anyone. It's just more of leave me the fuck alone and let me do what I got to do. <laughs> right. And so there's different areas where it actually serves me. It's never mean or cruel. Mm -hmm. Right. It's, it's, it's never putting anyone under me unless it's, you know, literally if I run over someone, right? But the point of the matter is there are areas in my life where my ego serves me greatly. Mm. And it shows up in relationships. It shows up in different areas of my life. But with the healing and the work and the mentors and friends I have around, you know, that's how I find the balance and get created awareness around those places, mm -hmm. right? Like that ego right there isn't serving right now. Beautiful. Right? You can actually st take a step back and be like, damn, you're right. Mm -hmm. You know, being able to step back and look when your ego's in overdrive and not serving and mm -hmm. you know, when you're communicating with someone mm -hmm. is super helpful, yeah. right? Rather than just punching in overdrive and being like, no, this is just how I am. Take me as I am. You know, like all these different areas that how I used to speak, right? Now to take a step back and be like, okay. So there's, there's ways where there's a balance and there's a way, way other areas where I'm full throttle with my ego. But most of the time, if I don't have my boots on, I'm, I'm trying to be as aware as I, and careful as I can, even though it's not perfect by any means. Mm. Yeah. I love that. Is it serving me or not? Oh, that's right. a great qualifying question. And that also breeds a sense of it's okay to have an ego. We all have egos like, you know, right. um, and it does. Yeah. It does serve us sometimes, but you're right. Kind of it's can be too self-protected from unhealed wounds and all of sure. that stuff. And so, yeah, it's a great way to figure that out as if it's like, well, do you like the result you're getting here? No. Right. Okay. Then it's right. not serving you very much right now. And in terms of um, the masculine feminine thing you were talking about, I, th I th that's a very, I was like, excellent answer for that kind of hard mm -hmm. question I asked you. Um, could you kind of explain what your perception of like living in a healthy masculine feminine balance looks like on the daily as a man? Yeah. If you would have asked me that a month ago, I wouldn't be able to answer that. The funny thing is I had a very, I finally, for me, integrated a big piece of the feminine. Nice. And what I realized is that as I started this work, I just focused on the masculine, 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 because I identified all the toxic areas and the wounded areas of my masculine mm. that I was. And during one of my psychedelic experiences, I identified um, how I had been harboring so much pain and anger towards my biological mother. Right. And so energetically, she came to me in a way and it was, this was a solo experience and one of my, my most impactful to this day. Mm. And she's like, I need you to see me. Mm. And I'm like, okay, what does that mean? And she's like, I need you to, the same way that you were honoring those parts of you. You still need to identify a lot of those great parts in you are from me. Wow. And I've never looked at her that way. It's always been my core abandonment wound. Right. There's been a lot of blame and resentment and frustration and anger because it's not like I ever got any answers from my mom or my dad. But for some reason, all my anger and pain went to her, mm. not, not my biological father. And so I'm like, okay, so how do I honor you? And she's like, I need you to love me. And I'm like, okay, so how do I, how, how do I love you? And she's like, I need you to forgive me. And that's the first time I've really stepped into forgiveness with my bio biological mother, because wow. since I started, it's always just been understanding. Like I understood she was 17 years old. She was homeless. She was probably traumatized. It was all here. Mm -hmm. It was never in the body. And so I processed that and fully integrated that with myself. And then I identified, and this is the biggest piece because of my abandonment wound of how much I created or constructed what love was supposed to look like in my life. Mm -hmm. And for those of you that have an abandonment wound, we're always that fear, like someone's going to leave us. And so we, we create the shield of protection that love, no matter if it's 
a partnership, a romantic relationship, a friendship, it needs to be constantly proving energy and it needs to be validating en energy. And we, and I realized I wasn't, I wasn't, it was a very subconscious, but that's what I was looking at love. Mm -hmm. And once I realized like, Hey, everybody shows up with different sorts of love. Right. And it looks different. Just as fingerprints looks, looks different on everyone else. So does how people show up with love. And I realized I sabotaged a lot of relationships and situations because it was never proving or validating energy. Right. And so I started integrating those big pieces of what love was supposed to look like. Mm -hmm. And then I got one of my friends on the phone during this experience. And she's, I, I explained to people, she's like a fairy. She's just very, very feminine, right? Just mm -hmm. very lovely. And I'm like, help me understand the feminine energy more. She's like, you need to understand that the feminine energy is free like the wind. It can be messy. It can be chaotic. It can be all these different things. And what I realized is, and this is really important for the men to hear, masculine is so structured, right? Like we need to leave it this time. We need to be ready at this time, like all these different things. And what I realized is my daughter has been teaching me, my daughter's 11. I can't get her to move faster than she wants to move. It doesn't matter. And she'll be dancing. She'll be singing. <laughs> like, dad, it's okay if we miss the previews. Hey, dad, it's okay if we're a little late. Like if we're going to catch a plane, it's a different story. But she's been teaching me just to how to allow the feminine be in their feminine. Mm. Right? Rather than so structured of X, Y, Z. And what that did for me it allowed me first and foremost to remove so much expectation on the feminine of how exactly it had, needs to look like. And it also gave me the ability to be like, okay, I actually get to honor this part, part of the feminine. Because as men, we look at women so sometimes and we go cross-eyed and we're like, what the hell is going on? We just don't understand because we're, we're trying to mirror them back to the way we are rather than honoring who they are as women. Mm -hmm. Right. And so it was a beautiful, beautiful process for me where I now get to sit in honor and more learning and understanding and patience without so much expectation of how love or the feminine needs to show up in my life. Mm. Thank you for sharing that. That's yeah. like fresh and deep, like a deep, deep part of your healing journey and like right. very understandable um, <laughs> where you were at with all of that. And it's just so right. beautiful. It makes me so grateful to the plant medicines that they're able to right. take us to such profound healing spaces. Right. Uh, they're like another coach <laughs> if, if done well, a really powerful mm -hmm. one. And thank you for that. And I think, um, I think for me, the way that I balance, you know, in terms of the masculine and feminine within each of us, when you said, that you did a plant medicine journey. I'm like, well, that's feminine energy to me. That's right. it's, it's the stillness. It's sure. the calm. It's the going inside. It's and that I think is part of that complicatedness that sure. men see in women a lot is just women really like that space. We really right. like to feel and go inside and like be in there. And I think part of like what we see in the difference between men and women in terms of masculine and feminine energy is it's been, that's just, I do think there's some biological wiring there. I have to say men yeah. do seem to be a lot more straightforward and like, right. just <laughs> a guy I was dating once was like, we're just simple minded. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so he's like, we're just real, just, just, there's nothing too crazy going on in there. Right. <laughs> and you know, you see those memes where it's like, he's not talking at the dinner table. Yeah, oh yeah. my gosh. He hates me. What did I do wrong? Blah, blah, blah. Right. And then he's like, I think we should replace the molding right there on the floor, right. you know? Right. Yeah. <laughs> so I think there is, you know, at least what I've observed, I think there is yeah. a little bit of maybe biological wiring there. That's a little different or something along those right. lines, but you know um, what you're already doing, I'd say would display a great amount of masculine feminine balance because you are doing like the deep work you are mm -hmm. pausing you go out in nature i know you love to do your cold plunges out in right. the icy river and like yeah, yeah that's kind of masculine in the action but the intention behind it is also balanced with the feminine of like i'm going inside myself i'm getting right. still i'm getting quiet so i can hear and then i can go create an alignment right. with that masculine energy and yeah it's really cool um any last, any last messages that you just would, if you got a mic, you want to get out to people. 
you know, I, I'll just share kind of in the process where I'm at right now. <clears throat> and I've always, since I started healing, I've been in this process, but I think I'm more in it, more intentional about it now. And that's questioning everything uh, about your strongest beliefs that you hold to yourself. And it's okay to be challenged. And it's also okay to do the work because they're, I'm not going to say healing makes life necessarily easier, but what it did for me is create greater tools to help me identify that things that used to spiral me don't necessarily spiral me at all anymore. Right. And I've called in a beautiful community to support me in the trajectory I'm going. Mm -hmm. Right. And so with all the turmoil going on in the world and all the uneasiness and political bullshit going on, there is a place where I feel we are responsible for seeing the projected trauma that's going on, especially with the powers that be. And so if I do feel it's our responsibility to heal and to help our families heal and to help our generations before us heal, I, I do feel. And if you do feel that you want to become a coach or you, that your story can impact, impact others and you can feel it deep down in your soul, it's going to get to a place, and I'm, I hope my voice sounds off when you're too scared or too shy to share what you have to share. It's no longer about you. Mm -hmm. It's no longer about you when you have something powerful or you have a gift to share and help this world become better and to heal. And so that's, yeah, what I want to share, lastly. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Thank you. And man, um, I'm like, I'll talk to you offline. <laughs> My mind's going so many places. I'll go ahead and direct you guys to, um, to Rob on, um, by the way, one last thing I just have to say is like, when we were talking about the whole social media thing, I remember I saw a post from you somewhat recently where you were talking about, I'm going to take a little break from this. I feel like I'm getting no. too caught up in this whole like likes and all that. So I'm, I, you were so vulnerable about it. And I was like, right. that's that's alpha. That's masculine. That's, yeah. that is courage. Yeah. Uh, like, look at me, look at me, look at me. Ting, 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 yeah, ting, yeah. Ting. Like you're getting all vulnerable. I was like, hell yeah, dude. Yeah. Get it. <laughs> that yeah. was amazing. But oh, um, you. yeah, you can follow Rob on all the platforms as Rob. Sirs yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Okay. S I R S T I N S. It's a tough one. Okay. Sir Stens guys. Yeah. Um, and, and then your website is also Rob Sir yep. Okay. Yep. Okay, cool. We will link that up and also your book, which also can be found on your website. So you guys can contact Rob through social media, through his website, I'm sure, if you want to reach out yep. about coaching. And yeah, we'll go ahead and wrap it up. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you.